very warm welcome to everyone. I say warm for Arthur. <laughs> it's particularly warm, warm up there, Cape Town, a bit, a bit chillier, but it's super to have an international audience and a national audience for this, our second series in the series, um, looking at modern movements in particular in relation to South African architects. Last week, as you know, it was on Harvey Fagan and Hank was just telling us about the new exhibition that's opening on Harvey's birthday. Um, I think it's, it's a Sunday, the 14th of November, and it'll be open um, till mid-February. Uh, please do give me suggestions on future Zoom series. I have to confess, um, I'm very focused now on real experiences. Um, we're off to Delair Graph tomorrow, um, DHK architecture, but we'll be focusing on the art and the landscape architecture. Um, and next week, uh, we've got a real variety ranging from Elliman House. Jane Fiss is coming to talk about her work with Paul Harris. And then we're doing city walkabouts. Um, and I'm conscious not everybody's in Cape Town. Um, so that's why I love these, these Zoom series. But just quickly, Arthur Barker, um, he is, has written a book, well, he's, he's written a chapter in a book that's going to be published next year by a Neapolitan publisher, Connection with the University in Naples, Italy, um, on Pierce Pal. And the book is about Bauhaus architects. And as last year, it was the anniversary, the 100th anniversary of Bauhaus. It's mm -hmm. particularly timely. Um, and I'm, I'm really thrilled that at the end, Arthur's been joined by um, Dr. Rudolf, who actually lives in uh, Pierce Pal um, apartment block. Well, when, it, when it's not COVID lockdown, it's a, it's a studio flat. So he's actually not living there now. Um, because when we did our series on brutalism, we had Annie Wingate giving us a feel of what it was like living in the Barbican. Um, and, and that added another flavor. And I'm conscious that some of you who tuned in, you, you do live in Piers Pal um, houses. So I'm hoping at the end also you can um, chip in. Um, and we have Hans who, who's built a couple of his houses. Um, so I'd like to hand over to Arthur, who's going to do an amazing quick <laughs> presentation, hopefully 40 minutes. I'm going to tell him when we reach six o'clock and um, then hand over to Rudolf um, after 40 minutes, then to whisk through some slides in San Martini Gardens. Um, okay, thank you. And Arthur, thank, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, for, thanks very much, Kate. Thanks for the opportunity. I promise today I'll make the presentation for those that are here today that were here last week as well, a little bit less theoretical and much more architectural. So Piers Paul uh, is the study of, as Kate said, a chapter for a book for an Italian publisher. And I had a month in February, the beginning of this year, to do the research before I had to write it. So it was quite a rushed endeavor. So what I'm going to show you today is some of the images of uh, the houses that I managed to get into and some of the drawings that I found. And then, of course, um, other information uh, that was relevant to the study. I have to give thanks, however, to a number of people. First of all, to Louis Stein, who put me in touch with many of the owners, uh, to one of my ex-students, the Faster Cork at Malaba Rist, who um, pointed me to a number of houses in Paul and gave me some drawings. And of course, most importantly, Till Paul, who is Pierce's son, who helped me greatly with uh, my questions. Fortunately, he had already written a book on the, bow, on the family, uh, on the P.S. Paul family, where I could get a lot of information about P.S.'s background, etc. And you'll see a number of those images, including the one on the left today, which is P.S. as a student at the Bauhaus. So, as I said last week, um, my take on the modern movement is that there were four mediations. Um, and the first is obviously today focusing on the Bauhaus and its importance in the history of architecture. The second was um, the uh, contextualization of modern movement orthodoxy. The third was that translation overseas all around the world. And then the fourth, of course, was the translation internally in specific countries and in South Africa by people like Revel Fox and Pierce and Harvey. And I wrote about that in a 
article in 2012 called um, Cape Vernacular Interpretations, if you're interested, where I summarize my understanding of how the modern movement was translated in South Africa. But today, let's focus on Pierce, and um, I'm going to talk about a number of houses that he designed for the van der Horsts, who are attending today, Eleonora, who was an advocate, and Johan who was an investment guru for Old Mutual for many years. Uh, they very kindly invited me into two of the houses that they own that were designed by Pierce. But the first image that struck me was this table that um, Johannes showed me in their house in Newlands, because it just absolutely epitomizes everything about Pierce's architecture um, and interior architecture and his understanding of materials, etc. So we have the steel framed table with this red gap and the floating glass, a very Bauhaus element in itself. And on the right hand side is an image of the very first proposal that Pierce did for their house in Pinelands, which was never built. But it's one of those traditional Pinelands houses. You can see the blue block in front is the addition which he proposed. A typical sort of planar architecture with the fireplace hidden as a stereotomic element in the corner and the other walls framing an open space. But for me, the epitome of Pierce's architecture as related to Bauhaus architecture is the house in Betty's Bay called uh, Platz. And it was in 1994 that Pierce began the design of this house, um, not long before he died in 2003. But it really, for me, returns to Bauhaus origins. Is the model of the house. Originally, the owner had requested, as uh, Laura told me, a Tuscan villa with a raised living area to see the views. But Paul convinced his clients that um, he uh, thought that the house should have a proper connection, not only with the mountain, but also the ground behind, and then partially raised to have views to the sea. So that's that green element that I've highlighted there in the middle, which is the living area. So it straddles north and south and then provides connections in both directions. And then the children's bedrooms were placed to the left and the main uh, bedrooms on the right hand side. So the central living core for me epitomizes universal spatial and technological principles learned from Mies van der Rohe through the carefully constructed interior, which is held, as you can see in this photograph, between two horizontal planes that are supported by cylindrical like columns. <laughs> There, the flat roof connects with the soaring mountain peaks. And uh, for those of you that might know Mies van der Rohe's mountain house of 1934, there's great similarities between this house's relationship to the landscape beyond through the flat roof uh, organization. I'm going to show you some plans of the house just to get a sense of where everything lies and then an associated image. One of the most important things I think is this entry route which uh, ties up with a peak beyond. If you look it up, they cut it off a little bit on the photograph, unfortunately. But it uses a typical architectural device, a sort of a Cropolean route, which meanders up the garden and then eventually turns you in a typical mm -hmm. architectural fashion at 180 degrees to where you came from. And then, of course, the main living room, as I said, facing north and south, so north to the mountain and then south to the views over the lake and then eventually the sea. And then we have the study area with its corner window connecting to the lake beyond. We have the main bedroom with a smaller corner window, but nevertheless still a connection. The main bathroom at the back facing the mountain with its corner release of space. And then at the back of the house are all the services in a typical uh, modernist functionalist way. The red bit on, was never built. Those are the garages and the service mm -hmm. areas. Uh, the client told me they were very happy they didn't actually do that. And then we have the family room, which the bedrooms are then surrounded by, or surrounding. And then the view from the main, uh, from the children's bedroom looking out over the lake. So this attenuated plan is an interesting variant of Paul's architecture, because as we'll see later on, he had three variants in his domestic one, in domestic uh, oeuvre. But this attenuated or stretched layout was very much used where he had the opportunity of the site which allowed him to do that. On the more compact sites, he would tend to cluster the organization around a courtyard. So here we have the final view from above. 
And there we have uh, the South African builder. I'm not sure what that man's name is. And I don't think it's Hans because I've got another photograph of Hans de Kwartznit. And then there's Mark Rosenbaum, who was the project architect for this house at the time, because Piers, as you can see, was a getting old, and then they have the client on the right-hand side is Johannes van der Horst. And there, it's another photograph of um, the builders, and the Dutch builder, the Hans de Quartz in it, and then we have Mark Rosenbaum again, and then the client, Johannes van der Horst and Piers. This is on the roof wetting of that, uh, of that house. So now I want to go back to his origins. So I'm going to read you a little bit of history. Um, but there we have a photograph of Paul at the age of 14 in front of the Ochersheim school, which was a trade school. Um, he was born in Ochersheim to Franz Paul, who, like uh, Mies van der Rohe, was a stonemason foreman. And his father was later employed by BASF, the guys who made the, the tapes in the 1970s. I'm sure you remember that. And uh, Pierce's mother was Anna Kempf and were married in 1903. And Paul's background and his apprenticeships and his work experience provided a very comprehensive foundation for the design approach that he would follow in South Africa. But he had an overarching Bauhaus education, which was 1930 to 1933, and he started there when he was 21. But that was supported by pragmatic inheritances, such as his father's stonemason work. Uh, he had a high school education, the gymnasium, and then later he was an apprenticeship, uh, had an apprenticeship as a joiner. Uh, from 1923 to 1926. And this is the only evidence, evidently, according to his son, of anything that Paul ever made with his hands. Um, he was evidently not um, that particularly interested in making. He was more interested in designing, but this is the project that he designed uh, as the entrance gates to his parents' house while he was at the Ochersheim school. Um, but then while he was working at a firm called Lickroth, who made classroom benches in Frankenthal, and that was between 1926 and 1927, he met a Mr. Weil, who was a graduate of the Tischenfachschule in Detmold, who persuaded him to register in their interior design course. And this is very important because later on, when you look at his work and understand how he designs, his interior architecture is as important as his architecture. And he was at this... Um, Tisha Fachschule from 1927 until 1929, and he qualified as a business manager in the first half of the course. And in the second half of the course, he focused on studying and designing rooms. Um, and he won a competition for bedroom furniture, outsmarting all of the senior students, evidently. And then after that, between 1929 and 1930, he attended an engineering focused Staatstechnikum in Karlsruhe. And, but after he saw a Bauhaus exhibition in 1929 at the Mannheimer Kunst Gallery, he then enrolled for the winter semester of 1930. And he gained credits uh, at being admitted then to the third phase of the course, which was the fourth, fifth and sixth semesters. So quite a detailed um, education that focused on making, it focused on interiors, and then eventually at the Bauhaus on all of the aspects, including architecture. So here's a photograph of Paul on the right hand side uh, bottom uh, at the at the um, Bauhaus and um, then some photographs of Mies van der Rohe on the left hand side standing with a suit and tie and on the right hand side a man called Ludwig Hilbersheimer which I must say I'd never heard of uh, until I started researching Paul and I think was more of an influence on his work than than um, Mies was, but we'll get to why later on. So here's also just some photographs of Paul as a student. If you look on the second from the right, you'll see Paul sitting on the um, roof of the Bauhaus. So Paul's, this is some images of Paul's student work, which was put together by a man called Correc mm -hmm. in 1995, when he put together the entire Paul archive. And uh, some of these images are also, by the way, in the UIA International Magazine of 1985, that was produced on Southern Africa, where they featured some architects like Harvey Fagan and Rebel Fox, for instance. But uh, in these images, you can really see the influences of Mies through the courtyard sorts of layouts. And then in his thesis, um, I think it's a very interesting combination almost of, um, of Mies, Korb, and uh, Hilbersheimer all merged into one. You just remember these stone walls because we'll see them later on again in a house in Paul, which I think may be Paul's house, not sure. So here's some more in in images of his dissertation, his final project. 
Um, there's a typical courtyard house that um, he designed under the tutelage of um, Mies van der Rohe. A very planar organization, as you will understand, so open and closed spaces, tight spaces, open spaces, and uh, climatically <clears throat> suited, obviously, and then completely ringed as an independent um, ensemble in this area. There's some images once again of what it looks like, but this man, this is what he did under the tutelage of Hilbersheimer. Who was a who was urbanistically focused, as you can see in this um, organization, where the students had to design these house, a number of houses in a in a setting, and the architecture, the flat roof, and then the brick wall. Now that brick wall was very much a Hilbersheimer thing, but also an early um, Mies van der Rohe thing. But I think just the tighter organizations and these little L-shaped plans speak more of Paul than his houses uh, influenced by Mies art. So there's some more images of those. But then after he finished his studies, he then undertook a travel tour, 1933 to 1934, where he traveled through Switzerland, Italy, and North Africa. And on the left-hand side are images from his diaries. What I find very interesting about the diaries is that there's no drawings whatsoever, not one sketch. Um, and I haven't seen all the diaries, so maybe I'm talking out of turn, but from the ones that I've seen that Till has shown me, absolutely no sketches. So it's interesting, he had a very good camera and he certainly got an eye, as you will see uh, in these following images. So there he is with friends on a boat traveling between uh, Italy and North Africa. In Italy, um, Venice, and here, I think you can see he's got a good eye. I mean, that photograph on the left-hand side is an amazing um, organization, just in terms of framing. And on the right-hand side, there were lots of images that I saw um, from his travels that focused on people. And I think this is an important thing that happens in his work later on, but he was incredibly focused on the client and their ways of living and understanding how they would live for the rest of their lives, in fact. Then he married... Uh, in 1936, uh, a woman by the name of Jeanette Maria Imelda de Hoog, who was a Dutch lady, who was actually born in Cape Town, interestingly enough. Um, her family had come out from the Netherlands to the Cape to work in biscuit factories. Uh, they were bakers. And um, so the parents were in Cape Town for a while, then they moved to Durban, then they moved to Johannesburg, and eventually they moved back to Germany. But anyway, Paul and Jeanette got together and got married in 1936 after meeting at a hockey match, evidently. And they had five children. Gisela, who's a biologist. Gotz, who's an architect. George is a doctor. Peter Jan, who's a professor of science. And then Till, uh, who's the son that I've been communicating with. Eventually, his wife, um, well, they relocated to South Africa, as we've seen in a moment, but she became his practice secretary. So in 1952, he emigrated to South Africa. Um, believing evidently the war in Germany wasn't yet over. But he was obviously encouraged by a South African-born wife and evidently the promise of work. So he began his architectural career in the Stellenbosch practice of Keith Green and Lochner. Uh, and then in 1953, after only nine months, he set up his, his own practice. He actually applied for a teaching position at the UCT, uh, which he undertook for about uh, 18 months. And he also had to register at UCT, obviously, to get a qualification in inverted commas so he could practice in South Africa. Um, and, and Till has discovered a very interesting um, personality that worked in his office in the 1950s. And now we're trying to follow up on this. this is a woman called Hilde Trappmann, who was a German architect who came here. And um, I've seen some of her work in the last week and uh, clearly a very talented architect. But perhaps she was also influential in the way that his architecture turned out. So this is um, a motivation or submission that he made at UCT, uh, probably around 1953 or 54, uh, where he had, was talking about architecture. And I find what interesting about this is his philosophy that he writes down here. They're quite telling the notes. So he talks about the human factor. He talks about materials. He talks about technology. And he's very much like Le Corbusier, who said that no material can be a hindrance to a clear plan and a modern aesthetic. It's just the way that you use them. Um, very much an understanding then of the translation of modern movement principles into a different context. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to point out uh, that you can never see is that just the control of light and the movement in Paul's houses. The photographs don't capture that, but it's very evident the way he manipulates those two aspects. Um, then 
something else that I found which was fascinating, um, but I don't want to dwell on it too long. On the right hand side is actually a Mies van der Rohe rehash of a student's drawing. And I always find these fascinating. It's the first time I've ever seen a Mies redraw a student scheme. So the top is the student scheme, and at the bottom you can see him separating planes and organizing space so that things flow past one another. So that was very much obviously what Paul was influenced by. But on the right, on the left hand side is one of Paul's students, um, own students, when he was teaching at the Staatliche Bauen Kunstschule in Mainz. Um, he asked the students to design this little dwelling. And if, when you look at this little dwelling and you look at the tightness of the plan and you look at the way that the sort of stereotomic heavy walls are balanced against the light walls, there's a sort of Miesian inside outside relationship, but it's much tighter and interestingly cupboards, etc., and things are used to create separations between rooms and services provide the, the gaps between spaces. So it's quite an efficient organization. And I think if I look at Paul's houses, that, that thing there, that house, or that little plan, should I say, um, in, through his influence, already begins to exhibit for me uh, the types of things that he would do in, in South Africa. But then he, he came to South Africa, he set up the practice, but then about, mm, what was it, about six years, 1959, but yeah, about seven years after he arrived, he got involved in the, um, the uh, conservation of um, of Brandwacht. Um and I think in a sense probably very similar to the way that Fagan um, became familiar with the architecture of the Cape was Paul's experience through Brandwacht and I think it must have had an, an impact on the way that he made his domestic architecture after that. But um, today's focus is going to be essentially on the domestic architecture. I'm just going to talk about some of these other buildings. This is the Blinkwater Flats or Blankwater, Jammer, flats in, um, in the Strand. Um, and a typical sort of modern movement organization um, where there's an honesty of materials, there's a structural rationality, there's a functional order, but then he tempers all of that by the way that responds to the sun and the views that you get and, and the natural light, etc. And then there's a very particular rigor in the way that the services are organized uh, between the, or on the edges of the courtyard. And that was very much the sorts of things he did in his Bergsach Motors in 1954 in Stellenbosch. It doesn't exist anymore. And then in Johannesburg, he designed Elliott Automation Building, also in this very strict rush, uh, structural grid and using uh, service zones as bookends for the buildings. And then, of course, a similar structural structuralist approach to the German school and also to um, St. Martini Gardens that Rudolf will talk about later on. This is a church he designed in Belleville in 1959, and there he is on site. Uh, he was meticulous on site, evidently, always involved in the process. And um, if you um, have a look at this church and then you compare it to his own competition entry, which is written in Correct's book um, for St. Mary's in Bremen, they are very similar um, uh, buildings where there's structural expression, there's an honesty in material, there's a separation of functional elements like the spire and the hall, etc. But the face brick for me recalls Van der Rohe's musings with that material. This is a typical Paul detail, which was, I think, even typical of the 1960s, if you ask me, whether you know, trying to get space to flow between rooms so we don't have a frame at the top of the door. Um, and then uh, his church in Durbanville, where um, quite different to his other buildings, but probably because of the religious um, um, functionality of this building has to operate in a very different way, but he tempers this uh, entry into the building with a huge pergola at a pretty low scale. And then as you move into the building, then it of course opens up to this huge split in the roof where the light filters through from two directions and that sort of continuous Bauhaus approach to separation continues in the detailing and how the roof of the hall meets the walls below. But when it comes to his houses, um, there were three typical organizations. There were the courtyard designs, there were the compact layouts, and then there were the attenuated or linear forms where he had more room and perhaps better views to express that architecture. My feeling about the um, courtyard designs is that 
they are sometimes forced. Um, I've been in a number of these houses where they have these internal courtyards and they're very, very tight spaces, which do allow light and ventilation, but one wonders why they were really necessary at the end of the day. Um, and many people have unfortunately filled them in, as we'll see in some of the photographs. So this is the first courtyard he designed in 1954, which is a house Trumpelmann in, in uh, Stellenbosch. And uh, for some of you who might have been on the 2007 or 8 tour, I can't remember, uh, that was organized by the Wolves, um, one could get into this house. This is for me the most articulated of his centralized typologies um, because it's very clever in the way that it mediates the site, the way that it steps down. You can see the roof there. That's an old photograph from architect and builder. So the roof meanders across the site, joining top to bottom, etc. Um, and then in House Strubich in Para North, it's a much more a tighter courtyard. You can see the extent of the site isn't as large as he probably would have wanted, but the house um, is aligned to views um, across towards Table Mountain, but unfortunately um, has been horribly altered on the top right hand image. So they've added this balcony, they've gone and filled in all the doors underneath. So it's really lost its, its Bauhaus qualities, but there were some details I could find, as you can see that separation of roof and wall, the staircase with the wonderful steel handrail detailing, the typical door and ceiling uh, connection. And then you can see the courtyard on the right hand side, which is filled with a uh, water tank. Um, this is another one I found in Stellenbosch, 1964. That was the drawing that the owner still has, House Brink. Um, but this has unfortunately been filled in, as you'll see in this image here. So on the right hand side of this image is the, the existing courtyard wall, which is now the doors and windows have been taken out becomes part of the room of the house. And nevertheless, there are still some other Bauhaus qualities that are still present. And then some other variants are House Plowman in Somerset West and uh, House van Heerden in Bedarsdorp, which looks like that. Um, this is a very old photograph taken by Mark Rosenbaum. And um, I did manage to get the copies of drawings from the owner, their blueprints as they were, and I managed to photograph them all falling apart. But it's a wonderful find because most of PS's archive, in fact, all of it is sitting in the Bauhaus Museum in, in Germany, in Berlin. So it's very difficult to actually get access to this stuff. But there was a story at some point that it was going to be donated to the UCT archive, but that evidently never happened. This house has unfortunately lost some of its pergolas, so its internal external relationships aren't as great as they were. But you can see the sort of planar wall again, sliding past other walls. These compact layouts, uh, that's his own house, 1954 in Stellenbosch. Um, I think, you know, these houses built on very tight budgets on small sites, so they had to be in inventive. But the house is a wonderful living room at the bottom, and then the upstairs are bedrooms which are shared by the children, and then the parents' bedroom. This is a view looking towards the studio, which is on the left-hand side bottom. And the view inside the living room with a very beautifully detailed ceiling. Um, with a number of articulations in it to allow light. So the ceiling is a continuous plane, typical Bauhaus fashion, but now we can't use concrete, we're using timber because it's cheaper perhaps. And now we have to articulate the ceiling to get the lighting in without destroying the integrity of the whole. So you get beautiful detailing like that. Oh, it's almost six o'clock. And uh, this is the house that um, Sir Faster Cook told me they think is a Paul house. Um, I think what's interesting for me is if you look at the stone wall, which is normally incongruous, it very much reminds me, as I said, of his thesis project. And there are other elements in this house, like the flat elements, the, the window going from floor to ceiling, etc., that make me think it possibly could be his, but I'm not sure. It's one I found in Chabot, 1959. Um, which has a typical linear layout, all the services on the one side, and then it has the living room, etc., on the other side. And a typical pile thing was to raise the house up to look over the views. So there are long views in the right hand side direction that the house then focuses on. It's a beautiful little one in Paul, House for Re, 1961. Um, very, very compact dwelling, but steps down the site beautifully. And then that living room, which is framed by the pergola, looks out over the Paul Mountains. the view from the living room, uh, the bedroom, typical um, planar architecture again with the windows from sill to ceiling. And then, um, as we'll see later on, a typical pole skirting detail where he also tries to infuse the modern movement, planar nature of things. So the white piece then separates or is separated from the other white piece by this horizontal piece of timber. 
Then House van der Horst in Newlands, which is owned, as I said, by Johannes and Eleonora van der Horst, uh, was his second, uh, third, well, third house designed, but second house it was built. Uh, he returns to the flat roof again, uh, save for a roof light over the compact service zone, which is sitting there behind the garage in the sort of middle upper part of the plan. Um, that's the living room uh, looking from the dining area. And that is the uh, courtyard pergola, which is a very typical feature of Paul's work, but here taken to large, I would say, excesses, um, a very extensive pergola that was beautifully detailed in its time. Evidently, the clients told me that he came with a number of options, obviously from the most simplest to the most complex, and they chose the most complex one. And then this pergola was replaced, I think, about a year or two ago uh, by aluminium because the other timber had started to rot. But you can see the wonderful relationship between inside and outside and the extension of inside-outside space that provides a series of mediations. Here's the detailing and typical, as we'll see in the seat now, this typical, let's raise everything off the ground, let's separate elements from one another. So we have the black skirting and then the brick and he was very particular about making these outside spaces in the courtyard that uh, came off the bedrooms where people could relax. And then, um, and one example, I'll show you another one. This is an additional bedroom that was built onto the house later on where he um, used his interior design skills to frame the beds and create the shelves and the ceiling, etc. Now, um, in 1968, Paul built himself a holiday house in Betty's Bay, and I think influenced by two things. First of all, um, Van der Rohe's Lange Haus in Krefeld in Germany, and on the right-hand side, um, uh, Le Corbusier's Villa Bazur in Carthage in Tunisia, which Paul actually visited. So this is a photograph by Paul himself when he went on the trip, well, the trip to, to North Africa. And there's the house sitting in the landscape in Betty's Bay. It's had an additional roof added also by Mark Rosenbaum later on. It wasn't an additional roof, the roof was changed. And uh, what is very interesting is the way that this house is punctured by this pergola, which runs right through the space. So on the left-hand side, we're facing the sea. On the right-hand side, we're facing the mountain. So the house has a permanent connection in both directions, but punctured through a pergola structure. And then we can see the staircase detailing with a very thin handrail. And then on the right-hand side, this massive view to the sea beyond with the planar roof running over the top. Um, his linear or attenuated forms are mainly on sites with extensive um, possibilities, spatial possibilities, and obviously view possibilities. So this is House van Arde. And I think here yeah, Paul returned to his Bauhaus training very much uh, organized through the structural, uh, those black painted beams and columns which order the plan. Um, and it is all made in reinforced concrete. It takes advantage of the site slope and the dramatic views through a series of roof pavilions around an entrance core. And then of course, with the terraces and the pergolas mediating uh, between inside and outside. Some interior views of the building with the stepped plan. So the bookcases, as I said, that element that comes from that student's work where staircases and levels are framed by functional elements. And there you can see the extensive views on the right-hand side that look out over the mountains of Stellenbosch. Separation again, a wall and roof. And then in House de Toy in 1970 in Nepal, he starts to, I think, um, adopt typical South African, but perhaps even Marcel Breuer type binuclear organization where you have the living room and kitchen on the left-hand side. And then on the right-hand side, you have all the bedrooms and you puncture through the middle. And that courtyard is there, the ubiquitous courtyard, which was um, a wonderful external space, which then linked up as a series of levels to the outside. And unfortunately, that's also been filled in by the current owners. But the house still has its feel, its um, planar feel, but now we're starting to adopt the sort of sloped roofs of the, of the cape, but also the sloped roof to suit the slope of the site, rather than a flat roof on a flat site. There are some of Paul's um, drawings, courtesy of Malabarist, and an internal view from the living room looking towards the kitchen, which is then framed by the glazed box. I think these details are for me most beautiful. Um, yeah, the idea of separation of the roof and everything else, again, is framed by beams, 
by the internal external connection between the bedroom and the passage and then the cupboards and functional elements acting as dividers still providing continuity of space um but it is i think paul's detailing that fascinated me the most um and probably obviously coming from his architectural education his training as an artisan but also his interior architecture training um, coming to the fore here so on the left hand side in his own house in 1954 uh, you can see the uh, the, the layering of the timber beams versus the ins inserts below them and the railing of the staircase, the balustrade becoming a railing going all the way up to the top. It's very reminiscent of, of, um, of Avaro Caesar's restaurant, Bonova restaurant in Porto. I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but it's exactly the same sort of attention to timber detailing and elements floating past one another. So there we have the doors again and the fan lights. This is in House for Re in Paul. And there's the typical poll detail. So this is one way I managed to recognize another one of his buildings that someone sent me a photograph of and asked me whether I thought it was a poll building. And because I saw that detail, I thought it must be, although as I will point out at the end of this lecture, there were people that worked with him that he could have influenced. And his detailing continues by the separation of elements, by the separation of elements. And then his detailing in the kitchens um, and uh, service areas where timber is protected by these aluminium layers and then drawers are separated by black behind them so that it looks like it's actually a gap sitting in there but it's actually closed. This is um, the bedroom to House van der Horst in Newlands where the clients requested a headboard <laughs> and Paul couldn't stop himself and eventually designed the entire room complete with bed and bedside tables etc. That was typical of, of, of Paul, though. He was so involved with his clients and their needs. I remember the Van der Horst telling me that he would sit with them for a long time discussing what it was that they wanted, but also what they wanted in the future. How did they imagine their life becoming uh, in 20 or 30 years' time? And he would think about that as he designed the house. But he had an influence on many other people um, that worked with him. And one was Siebert Witt, who worked with him for a number of years. And I discovered this house in Stellenbosch when I was driving past by accident on the way to Paul's house and I thought to myself, but this looks very much like a Paul. And then the owners um, fortunately let in this very strange man and allowed him to take photographs and then told me that it was a Siebert Vid house. And then eventually I found out that Siebert Vid had worked for Paul. So you can see many of the traits coming through. He also influenced people like Art Bale, who also did this wonderful house in Stellenbosch called House Brainziel. And then, of course, he influenced his own son, who was Gotts Paul, who became an architect. And this is the house in Berlin uh, by father and son, the photographs that were taken by, by Louis Stein. So on the 5th of September, sorry, 5th of October, 1987, Paul was awarded life membership of the South African Institute of Architects. And in 2001, he received their highest honor, which was a gold medal. And only two years later, unfortunately, 2003, he died on 4 April in Somerset West from cerebrovascular disease. And his ashes were scattered here where, these, uh, where this photograph is taken on uh, near the Steenbrus River on the way to Gordon's Bay. So I think it's very fitting that he came to rest between mountain and sea, because those were contexts that had played so heavily in molding not only the Bauhaus mantra, um, but the way that it had found its way to the end of the African continent. Thank you, Kate. That was that was really fabulous, quite uh, moving in there. Um, Rudolf, if you could whisk through your slides, because I've certainly got lots of comments and questions. Okay, let me get them up on the screen quickly. So, um, as Kate said, I live in St. Martini Gardens, and this is a building that uh, Paul did with Louis Carroll uh, in the early 60s. You can see here a, a photograph of the block about two or three years after it was completed. Um, it, it's an L-shaped uh, block, which was built first. And you can see the circle is uh, on that block. That's uh, a, a series of mainly uh, studio flats. And then the, the other block in the foreground is done 
I think about two or three years after that, without Paul, uh, just in the offices of uh, Louis Carroll. And it's interesting to see how the, the quality of the detailing uh, differs between the original. Yeah, you can then see the, the building looking back um, towards where the first picture was taken. And uh, Arthur, it's now that I've seen the photograph you showed of the Blankwart uh, flats, the layout is, is very similar. Um, <laughs> I'll show you a photograph where you can see the division between the inside and the outside or where the services are. So here you can see the two blocks. Um, it's quite a big apartment block. It's about 300 apartments. I think with the exception of uh, Disa Park in Freda, who closed three towers, it's the largest residential block in, in the city. Also a very beautiful mix of, of pallets of materials, which I can show you on on this photograph, on the detail one. So this is in the courtyard. Um, the courtyard used to be, the site used to be, I think the vegetable garden of the, uh, the uh, German church where it got its name from on the opposite side of Long Street. Um, so a very nice tree garden, a lot of exotics. Um, and you can see the division once in the apartments, it's a living area. And then on the one side of the studios, you've got the services, the bedroom niche, uh, bathroom kitchen. And a very nice use of um, precast concrete panels, very finely faceted. And then here you see the building in it in its urban context. Um, this is in Dean Street, I think, at the back of the French, between the French and the Italian consulates, and then the internal passages. And um, I think I'm, I'm one of the eight trustees in, in the building, half of which are architects. So it's a building that's very, very popular with, with architects. And one of the projects that we've done uh, focusing on the detailing is, is a simple exercise just of redoing the floor tiles in a, uh, as the original floor tiles got worn out. It was quite contentious uh, trying to, to convince people to stick with the original or an interpretation of the original layout. You can see in the background of this photograph also the very nice um, honeycomb brickwork, which allows the passages to ventilate naturally. Um, this is a detail from, from the entrance lobby. Uh, you can see the, what Arthur also mentioned, the, uh, his interior design training, very nicely detailed uh, post boxes. These, these were unfortunately painted at some stage. And then mosaics, which are all covered in gypsum plaster, which we, uh, had the gypsum plaster removed, unfortunately, it was in a very good condition. Glass mosaics that you also saw on, on some of his uh, domestic work on the houses. Here you can see uh, the combination of, of the honeycomb brickwork at the staircase um, and the, the what's what I'm looking for, the, the uh, concrete, concrete balustrades. And then on the right hand side, a very nicely detailed timber shutters that were used inside of the original uh, studio apartments to separate the entranceway from, from the bedroom niche. Um, this is, a, uh, is my apartment, but it has been renovated, but the I kept the layout. So you can see that there's high level light which comes in into the kitchen. And then a very nice big joinery unit, once again, wall to wall, fenestration unit rather, wall to wall, floor to ceiling uh, with the combination of different opening sections uh, leading onto the balcony. And then just uh, lastly, the bathroom and then the bedroom niche uh, inserted right into the back of the depth of the apartment um, and parquet, parquet floors, timber parquet floors. So very nice um, interior finishes. Okay, Kate, I hope that was quick enough. That was super. Thank you very, very much. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, Rudolf works for CPUT, Cape Peninsula University of Technology, and overlap just briefly with Arthur before he moved to University of Pretoria. And as you may know, CPUT can now offer more professional qualifications, um, really enhancing as an important school of architecture in, in South Africa. Um, if you would like to now unmute yourself and uh, do shout out any questions. I, I have to say, I'm so inspired by what both 
Arthur and Rudolph have said. And just thinking of the detailing from the skirting board to uh, you know, the flat roofs and, and the slopes. So I, I realise there's a lot to take on. And maybe um, I could ask, first of all, uh, where, where is Till, his son, Arthur? In Germany. Okay, Berlin. Uh, I can't, no, it's a Kronenberg. Um, uh, it, it does seem crazy that the archive is in Berlin. Um, and were they very receptive to you researching it? Um, yeah, look, I didn't get much access to the Berlin archives. Till was the one who helped me the most. And I think what happened with the, the archive was that, as I intimated at some point, UCT was interested in having it in their archives. And then I don't know what happened, if it was a miscommunication or something, but at some point in time, just after Paul died, everything was put into crates and shipped uh, across to, to the archive in Berlin. Um, I'd, I'd love some more comments and questions. I have to say, when I'm driving around, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know if I see anything that I think might be uh, a Paul or, or somebody who worked for him. Yes, there's another house in, uh, in um, for Camps Bay, what is it, just south of Camps Bay that he, was, that he designed that I haven't managed to get in yet. And there's a number of others that I couldn't get into in Stellenbosch. I hope that when I get down there at the end of the year, I can manage to get access to those because I like to make a proper record of all of them. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> Leela, um, you raised your hand. Do you want to put a comment in, Leela, or um, can you unmute yourself? Um, we've got. Um, 10 minutes, <laughs> I asked Arthur to be extra, extra quick. Um, I'm interested in also his commercial work. Um, mm. I, oh, hang on, uh, before we go on to that, L Leela's saying she can't unmute. I'll, I'm try I'll try and unmute everyone. Um, So with his practice, Arthur, how many mm. staff did he have? Um, and Not a very large staff. So that photograph that I showed of the one in Cape Town was evidently the largest staff he had. And then when he went back to, um, he only stayed in Cape Town for a while, working in the foreshore with about three or four people. And then also with uh, Hilda Trappmann, architect from Germany. And then when he went back to Stellenbosch, I think it was about I don't know, 56 or 57, then he went to uh, work from his house and then he worked on his own. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the question, thank you for that. The question from Leela is, did Paul do the German school in Tamboscliff? Yes, quite right. Yeah, you were asking about his commercial building. So that was one of them that I didn't feature. Then there was a factory in Somerset West. There was the parking garage in Stellenbosch, which isn't around anymore. There was the factory in Johannesburg. And then the churches, the two churches that I showed today, those are the ones that I'm aware of. There is, in fact, a complete list of all of his projects that was developed by um, Kurek, the one, the one guy who I showed you had um, documented all of his work. So I must try and think of where that thing was lodged. I did remember seeing it on the Stellenbosch Heritage website at some stage. Um, if people are interested, then maybe I can get that list and send it to you, for instance, and then you could share it with everybody. Yeah, maybe, please do. Maybe, and if people know about any other pile buildings, they must please let me know as well. Um, <clears throat> may I come in, Kate? Yes, please. I'm Hannes von Seil, and I, and I did that Stellenbosch website, I think, to which Arthur refers. Um, what is interesting, I lived in St. Martini Gardens when I came as a young man to the Cape 
in two different ones. And then I lived for 26 years in a Pierce Paul house in Stellenbosch. Um, and, I knew, and I knew Pierce Paul uh, quite well, also through Fabio Todeschini. Fabio Todeschini was professor of architecture at UCT, <coughs> was friends with Pierce Paul's sons and became an architect himself. And Fabio collected most of the material that went over to Germany. They did a retrospective in South Africa. And I think a copy of that is somewhere between Fabio's papers still, which it needs to be sorted out because Fabio died fairly suddenly. I think it's two years ago now. Yeah. And the papers are not sorted, but the papers are there. And Arthur, yes. we can arrange later. You can contact me because I have the names of most many Pierce Paul owners in Stellenbosch and some photographs and other things and material that's not on the website as well. So I just mentioned it very, because it came up now. So if Thank you, you very much. Stellenbosch, you can contact me through Kate. Thanks. Bye. I will do. Thank you very much, Hannes. And Arthur, are you familiar with the um, Paul buildings in Worc Worcester? No, I just sent uh, Mika a message to say, please tell me where. <laughs> I don't know about them, no. A lot of the, a lot of the documentation that's written is, is written without names. In other words, there's the name of the building, but it doesn't say where it is, which has been part of the problem. So we, we know that he designed the very, very first house in, in Stellenbosch and Louis Stein and I can't find it. Can't, well, we can't, we managed to get hold of the owner the original owner, and then he said he would try and find us photographs of the original house. And unfortunately, he's never gotten back to us. So we have to do this detective work. Sometimes it pays off and sometimes it doesn't. Arthur, how do your students um, relate to Paul's work? Um, I think the only time I've ever spoken about it was probably just after that article was presented or published, the uh, Cape Vernacular Interpretations one. Mm -hmm. um, they were more fascinated by Fagan than they were by Fox or Paul, interestingly enough. I certainly found it very hard to find information on, on Paul. Yeah, yeah. Harrison. So yeah, absolutely. can't wait for that uh, new Bauhaus book. Mm. With, with the churches, they're, they're just amazing. And, and I wondered um, if the, there might be something about um, that, that side, that sort of spiritual side you could elaborate on, or perhaps there wasn't any, mm. anything. I don't know. I've, I mean, I've spoken, the only people that I've spoken to that knew him well were the Thunderhorsts. And I, I'm sure they're online. Maybe they could say something about his religious affiliations, but I, I'm not aware of it at all. Start video. No, 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 no. Oh, there we go. Yes. Um, uh, also, Kate, uh, I think uh, the uh, interesting historic bit is that I think Paul came from a Catholic, probably devout family, because remember, uh, there were the various pews, 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 popes, and I think one of the children mentioned that uh, somebody like his mother thought he might become a priest one day, and... Uh, uh, that's probably where the name Pius comes from, uh, but I don't think he was uh, a man in the religious, in the conventional sense of going to mass, you know, or going to church, but somehow his aesthetic came across, certainly to me, as a deeply spiritual thing, uh, you know, a deep commitment to value and to culture and what is most important in, in human life. So in that sense, I think he was a spiritual man, but not conventionally religious. 
Thank you. And how, how did you meet him? Are you talking to me? Yes, yes. Sorry, Mr. Randolph. <laughs> Johannes. Uh, Johannes. What happened your incidents uh, is that his uh, son Till, the one who has been so helpful and actually lives in, at Kronberg outside of Frankfurt. And uh, perhaps Till is listening right now, uh, but Till and I uh, uh, were together in law school or from first year uh, 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 in preparation for law school for five years and we somehow immediately clicked uh, and uh, I ended up becoming a regular visitor in the Paul house for the entire five years and it became like a second home to me and I was just awed by the inspiration the sense of buoyancy I had being in that house the family and particularly this sense that you feel very cozy and yet you feel uh, you connect with things and, 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 and from that inspiration came the idea one day, please God, let me live in a, in a pure space. And that, of course, went into fulfillment a few decades later. That was wonderful. And the way also that you obviously got on very well with Horst, your, your builder, who is listening. Uh, no, that's Hans. Hans, Hans, Hans. Hans, Hans. Sorry, Hans. It's a question. Yes, yeah. uh, well, it, it is, it's a coincidence, but there's, there's uh, the Dutchman and a very, very competent builder who's been, uh, you know, and the amazing thing is, uh, it is said that when you've built a house, you won't talk to the builder again, and Hans and I became friends, and, <laughs> and we're still friends, and, and right now, Hans's firm is doing little bits of touch-up, keeping the present place in Newlands in, in tip-top order, so that, uh, that uh, friendship endures, thank heavens. As you say, that's just, just amazing. And how, how, how is it um, weathering? I mean, uh, standing the test of time and the maintenance is okay. I mean, all houses need maintenance. Yeah, no, no, uh, the, the design has been superb here and in Betis Bay, but we found, for instance, after 30 years, more than 30 years, uh, when this house in Yellows was built in the mid 1984 thereabouts, uh, we were, of course, scraping together everything to be able to afford it. Uh, and that included putting in good, but for, for those years, basic uh, aluminium uh, uh, glass panels and doors. Uh, and after 30 years, uh, being financially lucky enough to be able to afford it, we actually upgraded that to much, much uh, heavier quality uh, and moving from the uh, brown to black with double glazing and somehow that has just reinforced the quality of living because uh, it cuts noise away and very importantly, it stays cooler in summer and warmer in winter and it's very, very, very comfortable to, to, to live in now. It's now better than ever after 35 years. That's just fantastic to hear. Um, I thought that few minutes. Oh, Eleanor. Sorry. We thought that Pius would have approved it. Sorry. We, we always thought that Pierce would have approved, uh, approved our, our changes. No, not changes, I mean our renovations. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It was always with Pierce in mind, would he have? Yes, he would, because he, he would have used the new material, uh, which wasn't available at the time. But otherwise, we've been very faithful. And I must tell you, one of the listeners is a certain Alan Wilson. Uh, and he... <laughs> And he said to me in Betty's Bay one day near the, near the little lake, oh, that is a lovely house. I said, yes, it's our house. Ah, and he was showing such interest in Bauhaus. And then he really inspired me to, to preserve it and to preserve it in, in the spirit of Bauhaus. And he showed me examples of, of Bauhaus renovations in, in America. And I thought, well, it is worth it worth our while to, to uh, not to change it, but to just keep, keep to the original color scheme and, and yeah. the furniture. And I must mention that Pius basically designed all the furniture for our house. And um, whenever we wanted to buy something, we had to ask him. Because otherwise <laughs> he, would, he would say, well, it's a bit weak or it doesn't have the right weight or something like that. Meaning aesthetic weight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, that's just so inspiring and a really lovely way to end. Um, there, is, it, there are architects listening and uh, it, we can all just um, 
be inspired and it's just so lovely to, to hear, hear of your experience and um, to have these incredible homes and flats, <laughs> well, houses, homes, um, school on, on, our, on our doorstep. So um, I'm really happy if people want to email me um, with further questions or, or make connections. Um, I, I, I really love that. And um, I'm very grateful for Pat Rodemir for giving me a suggestion for the next series. And if anybody else would like to, to do that, um, that, that would be fantastic. Um, so just before we close, it's half past six, final comments and questions. Otherwise, uh, I'd, I'll, I'll, I'll finish. Um, Many thanks to Arthur. For yes. Writing a splendid way of uh, bringing, bringing to life and the sequence he found. Uh, it has really been a very, very great pleasure to work with Arthur and, and he's done a tremendous job, I think, in making sure that we preserve things and get the knowledge around while it is still available. Thanks a lot. And thanks very much for entertaining all my irritating questions. <laughs> we will see you again, Arthur. Yes, I look forward to it. Arthur, I hope you'll do an article. I, I know the book's coming out, but there's so much rich material. Um, and as I say, I couldn't find much on Pierce Pal um, in books or online. Um, and it's just fantastic for you and for Rudolf to, to share uh, your knowledge and, and experience and uh, sort of open our eyes because part of Culture Connect is you know, the public understanding of, of architecture, whether we're walking down the street and admiring what's around us or we're practitioners or, or, or clients. Um, it's just so, so, so important. Um, and we, we've never actually met physically, but I'm looking forward to you um, coming on the uh, Art Deco tour that I'm organizing mm -hmm. on the 11th of the 11th uh, when you're here for Harvey Bagan's uh, retrospective. Um, yes. And Rudolph, <laughs> I hope we'll work together again, particularly as you're based here. And of course, you know, I'm dying to organize a tour, not that you'll allow us into, into your, your flat. Um, but I've done a lot of tours in town and now I'll be including St. Martini Gardens. Yes, yes, we'll definitely make a plan. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I'm going to stop recording and I will, in time when I've managed to work out how to edit, I'll, I'll post you the link. I'll post everyone on the, the, the link to the YouTube channel.